The Arab Spring was always going to be a long process, not a quick fix. These are not our revolutions. We are supporting those fighting for their own freedoms and reforms. Uh, a huge pleasure that uh, one of my successors, my third successor now, uh, should have come back to talk to us uh, about the UN and the Arab Spring, something he is uh, very heavily and immediately engaged in, as you will see from this week's headlines and earlier headlines. Uh, there's a lot to talk about in the whole context of where the Arab Spring is going and how it connects with international norms and international politics. Um, Mark is a, a supreme example of exactly the right experience to bring to the permanent representative for the UK at the UN, a very good mix of developed world and developing world experience in his background, as you will see from the bio you've got in front of you. Um, he's, his job before going to New York was the same as mine, political director, which gets you in exactly the right place, both in the Foreign Office and in the uh, international diplomatic circle to do the job in New York. Uh, and we can see uh, both from the headlines and from the anecdotal evidence that comes back what an impact the UK mission is making in New York under his leadership. So. Uh, it's terrific we've got him with us. He's catching the six o'clock plane to get back to his duties. So he's just got this one in before he has to be dragged back. Uh, and so, Mark, all the more welcome for that. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Jeremy. It's always daunting to uh, speak in the presence of one's predecessors and one obviously as illustrious as, uh, as Jeremy Greenstock. Um, but it's, it's nice, actually, to be able to have a talk here in, in the UK because it's quite a difficult year to be speaking in the United States because 2012 is the 200th anniversary of what we call the War of 1812, but they're inclined to talk as the Second War of Independence. And it's the only time when the United States declared war on the United Kingdom but happily by the smallest majority in Congress that they've had for a declaration of war. And it's also the war in which we burnt down Washington, um, which actually is quite popular in, in many parts of America at the moment, but is still slightly embarrassing to defend. And uh, in our defense, it was because the Americans burnt down Toronto. So we were doing it for the honor of the Canadians uh, that we actually burnt down Washington. So that's going to be a little bit tricky to handle when that particular anniversary uh, comes around. But what I want to talk to you about today is the Arab Spring and the UN's response to it. Uh, I'm very happy to take questions or comments on other issues too that uh, are at the top of your minds or that you think should be at the top of my minds at the UN um, afterwards. But that's what I want to sort of concentrate my initial um, remarks on. Now, talking about the Arab Spring itself is a bit of a cliché. You know, we did think about calling it the Arab Awakening for a while, and then that didn't work very well because it suggested they'd all been asleep for a long time. Um, and, of course, as the seasons go past, you talk about Arab summers and Arab winters and all this sort of stuff. But we've decided to stick to Arab Spring, but it is just a shorthand for the upheavals, the revolutions, the protests that have been happening right across the region. And that debate about what to call it shouldn't detract from the real strategic nature of what is happening. And the Foreign Secretary is inclined to say that the Arab Spring is the most significant strategic event of the 21st century, more strategic than 9-11, more strategic than the financial and economic crisis. Now, given the economic turmoil we face, particularly in Europe, um, some may question this assertion. But there is no doubt that it is uh, an event, a series of events of real geostrategic significance. And it is being watched with extreme care by countries well apart from the region, uh, countries like China in particular. 
Now, you can argue that the Arab Spring is the third wave of democratization after Latin America in the 1980s, Central Eastern Europe in the 1990s. Autocratic leaders have lost power, and worse, in Egypt, in Libya, in Tunisia, in Yemen. The Syrian regime is under increasing pressure. There have been groundbreaking elections in Tunisia, Morocco, and Egypt. Later this month, there'll be presidential elections in Yemen. And later this year, there'll be parliamentary elections in Algeria and the first ever free elections in Libya. There is a reform process underway in Morocco, Jordan, Algeria, Bahrain, and other Gulf states. Even in Saudi Arabia, the decision to allow women some future rights to vote is a direct result of the Arab Spring. Now, others have argued that upheaval in the region has led to new threats in the form of the rise of political Islam. And it is certainly true that the recent elections in the region have benefited religious parties. In Egypt, Tunisia, and Morocco, Islamic parties have come out on top. They may well do so also in Libya, Algeria, and Yemen. But the rise of Islamic parties is not something that we should fear. It is the expression of the wishes of the people. We must respect those choices while upholding our own principles of human rights and freedom and pressing for the highest standards in others. And in standing up for the right of peoples in the region to choose their own representatives at the ballot box, we now have to accept their choices and work with the government's that have elected, they have elected to lead them. And as Cathy Ashton recently said, lumping all Islamists into one and the same category is misleading and unhelpful. And we can talk about the winners and losers of the Arab Spring, but one of the big losers is Al-Qaeda. Their narrative has been nowhere in the protests on the streets of the Middle East and North Africa. Now, before I set out some thoughts on the future of the Arab Spring, I just want to say something about the United Nations' response to events over the last 12 months. And I think we have to admit that prediction was pretty weak. In recent years, too much time has been spent at the UN, and Jeremy will remember this, on ritualistic debates between Israel and Palestine, and not enough on the fundamental issues raised by the lack of political and economic reform in the Arab world. In point of fact, there was some prediction from the UN Development Program produced a series of reports between 2001 and 2005 which analyzed the economic, social, and demographic strains in the Middle East and North Africa and accurately predicted that unless economic and social reform was accelerated, there would be political and possibly violent political upheaval. But these prescient reports did not lead to any political action. Nonetheless, despite that lack of prediction, I would argue that the UN's response has been impressive. Politically, the Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, saw immediately which side the UN should be on. A year ago this week, he stood alongside David Cameron in Downing Street and called on the Egyptian government to respond positively to the demands of those demonstrating in Tahir Square. Since then, he has made a series of consistent and bold statements on Libya, Syria, Yemen, and Bahrain. On the same visit to the United Kingdom, Mr. Ban made a very powerful speech at Oxford University on humanitarian intervention and the responsibility to protect. And in doing so, he has been prepared to ignore the criticism he has received, not only from those countries that he talked about, but from a number of other UN powers. My Russian colleague criticized him publicly when he returned from the UK and said the Secretary General of the United Nations is the servant of the member states. He does not lead the organization, and therefore he has no right to make statements on individual countries uh, than are not formally on the agenda of the UN. Of course, that is not our conception, has never been our conception of what the UN Secretary General's role is. And 
to give him great credit, Mr. Ban Ki-moon has ignored those criticisms from others who didn't want him to speak out about what was happening in the region. The wider UN system has also responded positively. The Human Rights Council suspended Libya. It established a, a commission of inquiry and effectively rejected Syria's candidature for Human Rights Council membership. The General Assembly switched accreditation to the Libyan opposition and adopted its first ever human rights resolution on Syria in December. And most significantly of all, of course, the Security Council referred Libya to the International Criminal Court and adopted wide-ranging sanctions in Resolution 1970 and then in March last year established a no-fly zone and authorised all necessary means to protect civilians in Resolution 1973. And together, these constituted the most wide-ranging resolutions passed by the Security Council for at least 20 years. It laid the foundation for a five-month military campaign conducted by NATO and a coalition of allies to protect Libyan civilians and led indirectly to the removal and death of Colonel Gaddafi. And it's worth noting that on the back of these historic decisions in March on Libya, much less reported, the Security Council also authorised military action by UN peacekeepers in Côte d'Ivoire against President Bagbo, who attempted to uh, subvert the elections when he lost the elections and to stay in power, and by doing so to start a civil war in his own country. And this led to a most unusual offensive military operations undertaken by UN peacekeepers in cooperation with national French forces. And as a result of this action, the former president, Bagbo, has become the first ex-head of state to be transferred to The Hague to face trial at the International Criminal Court. Now, clearly, that action, the NATO coalition action to implement 1973, proved a very divisive issue in the UN Security Council. Russia and China in particular, but also India, Brazil, and South Africa, argued that the coalition air attacks went beyond the Security Council mandate with the objective of regime change rather than the protection of civilians. And even now, five months later, Russia is trying to bring to the Security Council the question of alleged civilian casualties caused by the NATO bombing. But this criticism is wholly unjustified. During the negotiations of 1973, it was made very clear around the negotiating table what military measures would be necessary in order to impose a no-fly zone and protect civilians, particularly in Benghazi, from assault by Gaddafi's forces. And it was because it was made so clear that five members of the Security Council did not vote in favour of that resolution, including Germany. And unlike Colonel Gaddafi, NATO was incredibly careful and very largely successful in avoiding any significant civilian casualties, as the UN Secretary General has acknowledged. But there is no doubt that the sentiment in the Security Council is there, and it has made subsequent debates on Syria, Sudan, and Yemen more difficult. In particular, Russia and China vetoed a tough resolution in October which condemned the Syrian regime's violence and held out the prospect of future sanctions if they did not stop killing their own citizens. Russia, China, and the three IBSA countries explicitly said then that they feared an escalation of action against Syria, which would open the door to military action there as well, despite the fact that we had made clear that those fears were unfounded. And of course, on Saturday, shamefully, Russia and China again vetoed, this time an Arab-sponsored Security Council resolution, which was supported by all other 13 members of the Security Council, which would have offered full political and international support for the Arab League plan 
to oversee a political transition in Syria. And again, the Libyan experience played a part, although Russia's close security relationship with Assad's Syria was, in my view, the determining factor. China's motives are worth a whole lecture in themselves, but they clearly prioritized their strategic partnership with Russia above their interests in the Arab world in voting against that resolution. But that Libya backlash has not paralyzed action entirely in the Security Council on the Arab Spring. On Libya itself, the Council has mandated a UN support mission led by a British national, uh, Ian Martin, which will help the new Libyan government on security, rule of law, and preparation for elections. We have gradually unwound the sanctions imposed last year to free up assets held overseas, thus stimulating a resurgence of the Libyan economy. A UN team has also visited the Sahel region, assessing the implications of the Libya crisis on proliferation of weapons, terrorism, and migration in particular. And the UN has been active elsewhere in the region. UNDP is assisting the Egyptian and Tunisian authorities with elections and constitution writing. With support from the Security Council, the Secretary General's advisor, another British national called Jamal Benamar, has helped to broker the peace deal in Yemen last November on the back of an initiative from the Gulf Cooperation Council. And President Saleh is now stepping down, and as I mentioned, new presidential elections will be held later in February. The Secretary General himself has continued to speak out on developments in Bahrain, Iraq, and Sudan. A further UN peacekeeping operation was mandated in South Sudan to help ensure stability for the newest member of the world community. And a second peacekeeping force established in the disputed territory of Abyei between North and South Sudan. And nor have we given up on Syria. Saturday was a setback for the Security Council and a tragedy for the people of Syria. But we shall bring the issue back to the Security Council and there may be options also for action in the General Assembly of the United Nations. One thing is certain is that the Arab Spring has thrust the UN back center stage at a time when some commentators were questioning its value in the light of events like the failure of the Copenhagen negotiations on climate change. Now, looking forward, I expect the Arab Spring to continue to dominate the UN's agenda in 2012. The United Kingdom takes on the rotating Security Council presidency in March next month. And among the priorities that we are going to be focusing on in March are Somalia, firstly, following this month's London conference. The Prime Minister has called a conference on the 23rd of February to try and take a strategic look at the different problems of Somalia, the piracy, the counterterrorism, uh, the politics, the humanitarian crisis, with a view to trying to bring round a coherent plan behind which the international community uh, can rally and lend its support with a chance, I wouldn't put it higher than that, but it's a chance to put an end to the 20 years of bitter civil strife in Somalia. Secondly, Sudan, where we've worked quite hard during the time of independence of uh, South Sudan and the referendum this time last year to bring a strategic focus to Sudan. Sudan is an issue on which the five permanent members of the Security Council should have identical strategic <coughs> objectives. And if we all work together with the different influences we have, whether they be in Juba or Khartoum, um, we could actually make a difference and reduce the risk of that, those two countries now returning to war, as has happened many times uh, in the past. And on that, we want to work very closely with the African Union, which... Uh, particularly under President Mbeki's uh, leadership, is playing a leading role in a number of the Sudan-related problems. And most importantly, we plan to take a strategic look at developments in the Middle East and North Africa during our presidency, one year after roughly 
the upheavals began in a special ministerial level meeting of the Security Council chaired by the Foreign Secretary. In terms of the future of the Arab Spring, a lot has been written, and I would just want to highlight three key points. The first is that progress will be uneven across the region, because although similar impulses have been behind the uprising, the countries and the societies in the region vary hugely in their wealth, in their traditions, and in their institutions and different states are bound to move at different speeds and in different ways. Many countries, such as Libya, as I mentioned, are holding elections for the very first time ever. Reforms in Morocco and Jordan will take time. Assad in Syria may hang on for some time. Developments in Syria will be critical for the future of Iran and Lebanon. The outcome in Libya will be vital for the prospects of the international community coming together after the divisions of 2011. But in a strategic sense, I believe that Egypt is the most important of all. 25% of Arabs live in Egypt. And events there will reverberate, for better or worse, right across the region. And that is why the European Union, with its neighborhood policy, tackling what's called the three M's, uh, money, markets, and mobility, and the G8 with its Deauville partnership agreed last year, are focusing so much attention on Egypt. It's the success of these initiatives which will be crucial to the wider success of the Arab Spring. The second point is that this means that we need strategic patience. The Arab Spring was always going to be a long process, not a quick fix. These are not our revolutions. We are supporting those fighting for their own freedoms and reforms. So as Islamic parties do well in the first round of tentative elections, we should adapt to the new political realities while continue to argue passionately for our values. We should avoid the temptation to, be, to pick champions. We should not be nostalgic for secular dictators. I expect that by this time next year, the key principles that underpin democracy will have taken greater hold across the region. And by that I mean the need for popular consent, the right to seek redress, respect for human rights, the space for freedom of expression. And the third point I would make is that the Arab Spring is irreversible and positive. The young people of the region continue to march for freedom and democracy as well as for economic opportunity. And these are values that the United Kingdom has always promoted. We may call them Western values, but in fact they are not. They are universal values. While much of Europe had still to emerge from the Dark Ages, it was the Baghdad of Harun al-Rashid that saw a flowering of free religious debate and an openness to learning from non-Muslim sources. Free speech, the rule of law, pluralism, these are aspirations of people everywhere and we should stand by all those who strive for them. Now in conclusion, I just want to mention two challenges that I've touched on only very lightly um, but are highly relevant to what is happening in the Arab Spring. And the first is the Middle East peace process. The Palestinian demand for statehood cannot be divorced from the Arab Spring. <coughs> that conflict remains the poison in the well of relations between the Christian, Muslim, and Jewish faiths. This was brought home to me very forcibly when I was ambassador in Pakistan. Pakistan has conflicts on both sides, Kashmir obviously with India, Afghanistan conflict, both conflicts in which Muslims are at the heart. And yet, in all the polling we did, in all the conversations we had, even in Pakistan, a non-Arab Muslim country, it is Palestine that was right towards the top of their agenda. So this is a crucial issue that cannot be put uh, on one side. 
Of course, the prospects are not bright, and electoral politics come into play, particularly this year. But there will never be long-term stability in the region without a sustainable two-state solution to the Israel-Arab conflict. And conversely, concrete progress towards such a solution would help cement democratic gains across the region. And the second issue is Iran. Iran has tried to claim ownership of the Arab Spring, but events have only gone to highlight Iran's hypocrisy, given the continuing internal repression of all opposition inside Iran. Furthermore, Iran's illegal nuclear ambitions and its malign role in supporting terrorism within the region both pose major challenges. And when change comes in Syria, that will have a dynamic impact in Iran. In all this, I have no doubt that the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon knows where the UN needs to be. But if the organization is to continue to respond effectively, it needs more than a wise and perceptive Secretary General. How key players engage at the UN and see their role, not just the five Security Council permanent members, but also the emerging powers like Turkey, Brazil, India, and South Africa, will determine whether the international community meets or flunks the challenges posed by the Arab Spring. Thanks very much.